every once in a while we run across a Bible verse that is, well, let's just say it has wrought an undue amount of havoc upon the life of the church for centuries. Today, we're going to talk about Mark 10, verse 45. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and get ready for this, and to give his life a ransom for many. Stay tuned. This one is huge. You're listening to Mainline with your host, Reverend Stephen D. Martin. I mean, every once in a while we can get into kind of obscure theological and biblical critique here, right? Why not? Hey, I've got an idea. What if we hear a, well, we meaning I, hear a really, 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 really good sermon, and it happened to be delivered by a good friend of mine? Why not put it on the air as the podcast of the week? This is really big, and I wouldn't lay this on you if it weren't really, like I said, really big. Ransom theory, you know, that's one of those really kind of obscure theological seminary kind of conversation things that, you know, we don't really think about too much, and we certainly don't talk about it, and we don't really dive into the theology or the history, the church history that lies behind this verse and how it's been interpreted. But this is an important one because as I think as we look around the world today and certainly as we look around the American church, we see a lot of really, really bad going wrong. I mean, really, really bad stuff. The church is off the rails, shall we say, in many quarters. And I'm going to credit it to... Let's just say it, bad theories of atonement. Ideas matter, words matter, but ideas matter, and they plant seeds that bear fruit that is either good or bad. Today we're going to talk about how an idea has become part of the church's life, but maybe needs to be reexamined. Stay tuned. Before we get into it, I got to make a plug and, you know, it's relevant. I think we're all looking for ways to uh, connect our ministry to the current day situation, the current day world. And I have become absolutely convinced that coaching is the next big thing as far as clergy skills and capabilities go. Coaching is more than therapy. Therapy looks at the past. It tries to help you understand your present by understanding what happened prior to today. Coaching is not even consultation. Consulting is having somebody else come in and tell you what you should do. Coaching is really about having someone walk beside you and help you find your way forward. Not the way, but the way that you can do, the way you can lead, the way you can bring out the best in your congregation. You know what? A lot of pastors are learning to be coaches themselves. A lot of pastors are learning that coaching is a set of skills that can grow their ministry, but also, eh, let's just say it, allow you to hang your shingle out and draw upon a new base of client that um, maybe just wouldn't have darkened the doors of your church otherwise. We're all looking for a way to do it. We're all looking for a way to connect. We're all looking for a way through this pandemic and its after effects. Why not explore coaching as a possibility, as an added skill to your your skill set as a pastor. At the Lakelands Institute, we've got a 
comprehensive coaching program that is in partnership with one of the top coaching organizations in the world. You can get your certification from top to bottom to become a a professional certified coach. Why miss that opportunity when it's sitting there right in front of you? We encourage you to go to the lakelandsinstitute.com website. That's lakelandsinstitute.com. And check out our coaching programs. Maybe you need a coach and maybe you would like to have coaching, a, a coach to go alongside you as uh, in, in your daily ministry walk. Maybe you would like to learn to become a coach yourself. Either way, we've got you covered. That's lakelandsinstitute.com. Most of the time on this podcast, we it's a conversation, right? It's me interviewing somebody else. It's us talking together and trying to glean something out of uh, someone's great thought. Um, today, it's a little different, you know, and because I just had to share this with you. I I work with a church in, in my own hometown of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and my best friend is the lead pastor there. And I hear him struggle through things constantly, and I hear the way he puts himself out and and kind of, you know, really makes himself vulnerable in his preaching. But this week was really special. It was really different in the way that he took a really, really obscure topic, ransom theory, atonement theory, these things that we don't really talk about that much in church— and he really went outside of that kind of standard way that we preach, you know, where we tell stories and we try to inspire. He really went down to the nitty-gritty of the church history involved in this doctrine. Now, I have been really taken by something that I it really didn't occur to me until just a few years ago when it was pointed out to me that the Apostles' Creed, you know, this this creed that we say in a lot of churches every week, you know, as an affirmation of our faith, it skips over the life of the historical Jesus. You know, I've mentioned this in podcasts before. It skips over the life and the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. It focuses only on those things that pertain to how Jesus, how God liberates and rescues us spiritually. Now, that in itself is not a bad thing. But when that is something that takes place in a way that takes us away from the teaching, you know, the, the, the ways that God has taught us how to live according to Jesus' life and example, I think we have to really back up and we can see how some things got out of, uh, uh, out of, out of proportion in the life of the church. Hey, enough of my yakking. I'm going to um, introduce you to uh, the Reverend Mark Flynn, who this is a recorded sermon from yesterday. It's yesterday's lectionary reading, and we're going to hear that word as read by Reverend Jenny Kaufman, and then we are going to hear Mark's sermon. And I really, really encourage you to take this message to heart, listen carefully, and I'd love to hear some responses to this. You can respond either on our Facebook page, Lakelands Institute Facebook page, or you can just, you know, talk about it amongst yourselves. This is a good one. Stay tuned, listen carefully. And go forth and do likewise. Hear now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Zebedee's children, James and John, approached Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to grant our request. What is it? Jesus asked. They replied, see to it that we sit next to you one at your right hand and one at your left when you come into your glory. Jesus told them, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I will drink or be baptized in the same baptism as I? 
We can, they replied. Jesus said in response, from the cup I drink of, you will drink. The baptism I am immersed in, you will share. But as for sitting at my right or left, that is not mine to give. It is for those to whom it has been reserved. The other ten, on hearing this, became indignant at James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know how among the Gentiles, those who exercise authority are domineering and arrogant? Those great ones know how to make their own importance felt. But it can't be like that with you. Anyone among you who aspires to greatness must serve the rest. Whoever wants to rank first among you must serve the needs of all. The promised one has not come to be served, but to serve, to give one life in ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. To grasp what Jesus is trying to communicate to us in this gospel reading, we have to take a rather different approach this morning than we normally take, an unconventional approach. And by that I mean we need to explore for a little while what it is that's wrong with Christianity in the modern world. Now if that seems kind of ominous and depressing, hold on to hope. Because It's also our opportunity, when we name what is wrong, it's our opportunity to name what's right. And according to Jesus, knowing what is the right path is a really important thing. I'd remind you that in the Sermon on the Mount, he wrote, he wrote, he actually said it, sorry. It's written right here on my page, so that's why. The gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Our task, it would seem, as followers of Jesus, is to compare what we believe, how we're walking, with Jesus, what he taught and how he's walking, and then choose Jesus when those two things are incongruent. Well... That sentiment's exactly at the heart of our passage today from the Gospel according to Mark. Because you'll notice it begins with James and John obviously misinterpreting what it means to follow Jesus. They are requesting positions of power and authority. They want to sit at Jesus' right and left hand. And that attitude, if you go back and read the passage immediately before our reading, It makes their words all the more shocking because in that one, it's the third time that Jesus tells them, I'm going to be arrested and they're going to hurt me and kill me. I'm going to die and then be raised. And so here's Jesus who's right in the midst of talking about how he's going to confront the authority and the power in Jerusalem when the disciples are kind of trying to uh, outmaneuver one another to see who will have positions of power and authority. I'm sure they would say, just like we say, but I'll use my good power for good. We'll do it the right way. And you see, that's the problem. That's the human response. We all say that. And Jesus, as he gently chastises, because he is really gentle, he's not harsh, as he's gently chastising all of the disciples, because they all jump on board this idea. They all, the other disciples think, oh, James and John snuck in the back door. I wish I'd have said it first. So when Jesus is chastising them, he's kind of chastising us, and he wants to turn their understanding of power, our understanding of power, on its head. He says... Those in power in the world will do anything they can to hold on to their own power to protect their places of privilege. But it can't be like that with you, is what the gospel says. He calls us to be, in this sense, very countercultural. He's tying greatness. You want to be great? Wonderful. 
That looks like service when you're following Jesus. Whoever wants to rank first among you must serve the needs of all. Self-interest and self-protection are not the way of Jesus. But sadly, like all the disciples, most of us are pretty guilty of overlooking those words. We overlook that what is 90% of that passage we just read, and we focus on the last statement. Certainly the church over the course of its history has focused a great deal of attention on that last statement. I'll remind you what it said. The promised one has come not to be served, but to serve, to give one life in ransom for the many. Now, Christians have a long history with that word, ransom. To ransom is one of the connotations of the Greek word that's being translated there, litron. You can, you can translate it ransom, but you can also translate it redeem or deliver, like God delivered the, Egypt, uh, the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, to redeem, to deliver. And, and while it's clear the context of that gospel reading, we know something is happening. Jesus' death does something to free the captives. Jesus' death causes some divine action to set people free. And considering what the context is, if you think about it, Jesus has been talking about using our power for good to serve the needs of all, not to lord it over people. You'd be the very first understanding you would get if you didn't know the context of that word ransom is to assume that what Jesus is doing is about liberating us from a world system where powerful people oppress other people, where powerful people use their position and their privilege to hold on and to lord it over, to use Jesus' words, to lord it over other people. And Jesus is inviting us into a new kind of community, God's community, where greatness is tied to service. Unfortunately, the church's interpretation of litron, that Greek word, took an ugly turn in the third century. Now, I know that most of you don't do church history reading at night, so I'll remind you of something that you've heard many times in your life in worship settings. And that is that the early church, when it talked about how God reconnects us through Jesus Christ, how Jesus' life, death, resurrection, that whole shebang, how we somehow find a reconnection to God, in the very first years of the church, what they talked about was how Jesus was sinless. That Jesus was human like we are and was faced with every temptation like we are, and yet he did not sin. And when Jesus didn't sin, the very first person to not sin, something opened up in the creation. And Jesus was able to create a new pathway, to blaze a new trail. And that those of us who follow Jesus on that path, looking at the example, this is how God wants us to act, when we follow Jesus, we have a reconnection with God. Or to put it in a way that you may have heard all your life, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was lost, meaning what? I couldn't find the path. I didn't know where I was. And then Jesus showed me the path, and I am now found, and I follow him. That's the point and the way that the early church looked at what Jesus accomplished. But that early church focus with Jesus being a trailblazer and an example, changed in the third century. When the church, which was led by a theologian named Origen, chose to emphasize that connotation of ransom of that Greek word litron. Not redeem, not deliver, but ransom. And he took it in a very literal way. Suddenly, the church was talking about how God ransomed humanity from Satan. You see, Origen had decided that human sin caused Satan to own us, to own humanity. And in order to escape Satan's power, a metaphysical transaction had to be made, a payment had to be made, and that God had agreed to allow Jesus to die on a cross to pay that ransom to Satan. You might recognize that. You can still feel it in some of our hymns and some of the language churches around the world use. 
when they say things like, Jesus paid it all, it's that ransom idea. Well, it's really interesting. A few centuries later, someone in the church looked up and said, I don't get it. Why does God owe Satan anything? To which the church collectively went, oh, yeah, that doesn't make much sense, does it? (laughs) But here's the thing. Even after that idea that God owed Satan a ransom was discarded, the larger idea that a price had to be paid for sin, that blood had to be spilt in order for sin to be forgiven, that bigger idea had become entrenched in our way of thinking. It had become entrenched in our hymns, entrenched in our worship, entrenched in our rituals. And theologians had modified that earlier ransom theory of atonement. That's what it was called, the ransom theory. But they didn't discard it. What they did was take Satan out of it and put God into that place. So now the church started talking about how God was demanding payment by blood for sin. And yet we spent centuries arguing, theologians arguing over, now why did God do that? Why did God demand a blood sacrifice? Well, God's honor was offended first. That's what we decided, God's honor. And then they set that aside and said, no, it was God's justice. And by then we're in the 12th century and we're very focused on God demands blood to be spilt by somebody. And Jesus' death was the inevitable conclusion, the transaction, however we wanted to define it. We don't understand how it really works in this metaphysical way, but Jesus paid it all. You see what had happened. Instead of defining Jesus' death as this tragic result of humanity rejecting God's grace, instead of celebrating how God continues to love us so much that Jesus suffers for us, and we only suffer, think about it, we only suffer for the people we love. That's the defining, that's how you can tell when you love somebody. You're willing to hurt for them. But instead of talking about that, The church focuses on how God demands blood and that suffering is the means by which the world is restored. You notice what we've done. All of Jesus' teachings about how we are to live, that first 90% of the text we read, all those were placed on the back burner and the church made Jesus' bloody death the focal point. And not surprisingly, when that's the focal point, what happens? All the guilt comes with it. Oh, you see Jesus, that should have been you. Oh, you see that, that you, you should feel guilty. The ugly consequence of that focus is that whenever church leaders over the course of those next centuries would see what they called sin in the world, they felt that, well, just like Jesus showed us, somebody's got to pay, somebody's got to suffer. And it wasn't very long before the church started acting like, well, we're going to help God out. We'll be inflicting the punishment now. We're going to be finding ways to ostracize entire groups of people that we've already labeled as sinful. And again, think about it. They're ignoring all that Jesus had said to James and John. Be servants. Don't use your power over people. Be a community where service to others, even to the point where you suffer for them, is what greatness is defined at. We set all that aside for that last phrase, a ransom. And let's face it, we could make a long list and spend a lot of time over all the the centuries, mistakes that the church has made in setting aside Jesus' words about turning the other cheek and loving our enemies and take up your cross, suffering and serve other people. We could, all the times we set all of that aside to declare what groups of people were sinful and to exclude them and to use all our military and economic force to coerce them, to push them out from our presence. And unfortunately, that's still how some churches function today. But thanks be to God that identifying what is wrong is not the end of the story. We also have the privilege of proclaiming what Jesus really talked about in the first place. What is right, and it's the path of service. What we heard him talking about 
with James and John, those who were vying to find power in the world. He said, oh, you can have power, but you get it by serving other people. You get it by taking up a cross. We have the privilege of being the group that sets aside Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hand of an angry God, to take off our t-shirts to say, his pain, our gain. We throw that stuff aside so that we can talk about forming a community of grace. We are the ones who teach that God doesn't demand blood to redeem us. We can embody the message that it's the love of God expressed in Jesus Christ that saves us. A love that is so great that it would rather die on the cross than to give up on us. So take heart. I mean, there's a lot. When we look over the history of the church, there is great pain. And we caused a lot of it. But we shouldn't give up on each other and we shouldn't give up on the church. You know, every single one of us in this place has a history. And we wouldn't want it broadcast about all our mistakes and our moral failures. Well, guess what? The church has a history too. And we suffer from the consequences of our bad decisions individually, and we suffer from the consequences of the bad decisions the church has made in the past. But God continues to love us. And thanks be to God, God continues to love the church. And to call us to be that example for the world that desperately longs to hear that it is loved. That we take up the mantle of Jesus Christ and follow Him. And that is really good news. As a college student, even back into high school, but certainly as a college student, I embraced uh, Southern evangelicalism with everything I had, you know. So I get this concern that evangelicals have about where people spend eternity. I get it. I understand the impulse that, you know, when, when, when you're worried that somebody you love and somebody you care about doesn't have faith, that, you know, that that's a big deal. And, and, and you want people to experience the joy and the happiness and the things that you find in faith. You want the, to share those things. But I get that. But Mark just laid out an incredibly powerful understanding of how that concern by itself really has taken the church into places it doesn't belong I hope you enjoyed this this kind of different format today. You know, I, and I thought about it. I thought, well, heck, this is my podcast. I can do what I want with it, right? So I did it because I wanted to share this word with you. I want you to think about it, and I want you to let me know if you agree with Mark or if you don't. Um, let's have a conversation about it. But most of all, we have a... A long-term obligation to people and we do care about the afterlife and how Jesus saves us but we also care about what Jesus taught us and how we have been set free to live according to the way of Jesus because we don't have to worry about what the outcome is God's already got that under control thanks for listening this is Reverend Stephen D Martin for the Lakelands Institute come back next week we've got a series of really really terrific conversations lined up for you for the next several weeks so i hope you'll um hope you'll hope you'll join us take care